Hey space fans, it's Tarek Malik, editor-in-chief of space.com. And on this week in space, we talk to former NASA chief scientist Jim Green about the early days of the moon, how it broke off from Earth, and what things were like in those early days. Check it out. So if if my dumbbell math was correct, and the reason Tarek and I have to think about these things so much harder than you do is because our, our math scores weren't particularly high once we got to higher mathematics in the university. But everybody who listens to the show knows that already. Uh, the moon way back when, when it was much closer for Earth radii would have been like 20,000 miles or so above, which would make it very large in the sky. That'd be a whole different experience, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it would be. If, if, if you could stand the heat of the surface, uh, if you were on the surface, the moon would just be enormous. Uh, 16 times what it is today in size, and it already looks kind of big. But I mean, it would really be huge. And I think we'd be fearful that, you know, it looks like an object's gonna come and hit us. But uh, over time, it, it moves away. The other fascinating thing that it, about these samples that we have from the Apollo is we're continually analyzing them. And one of the things that we have found is that they have uh, what's called a remnant magnetic field in them. And so for more than 40 years, the, the controversy is, well, where did it get the field? Did, you know, did, did it get it from impacts that occur? Uh, does it get it? Does does the moon actually generate its own magnetic field? You know, and uh, and and we now have pretty well solved that, which which to me was really exciting because well, that was, yeah, that that was something I really wanted to ask you because by the way, I think we forgot to mention specifically that the article that that Rod was talking about. You you you've got this article all about volatiles on the moon and the the, the moon's history and its birth in uh, it's in Ad Astra. Is that right, Rod? Uh, no, 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 actually, it's, Jim or, sent it to it's me. In yeah. Room. Yeah, it's in it's Room. It's in Room. Room. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, so that other cool space magazine. Exactly. It is a cool People space should, magazine. Should yeah. Read, yeah. Uh, At Astra, uh, I'll, I'll have to publish something in that next. <laughs> anytime, my friend. Okay. I'm waiting. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. I got some ideas. I mean, I, I, I always love me. Uh, a giant impact hypothesis when it comes to like the moon's formation and how it looks so similar to the earth. I was really struck in your piece about looking for how certain types of volatiles that I never thought about, nitrogen, for example, I think, cause we're talking about magnetic fields, uh, actually end up in the, in the regolith of, uh, of, of the moon, because you, you describe that in that early phase, when it's you know the the moon is its solitary body a separate body but it's still kind of not not very far away that that it had this magnetic field i would assume because it's still also got a molten core or or, or what correct is that correct right? correct but that it's yeah. also mixing with the earth's magnetic field which yes. i would assume was much bigger that allowed material to keep on transporting to the moon despite the fact that the impact was over with I, that just boggles my mind and i don't understand how that works and i was wondering if you could explain sure <laughs> to, to my brain how that would sure work. so magnetic fields are uh really wonderful uh highways for charged particles um and the lower the energy the more closely they are connected to the magnetic field and follow them very closely and so, indeed, the Earth had a magnetic field. We still do today, thank goodness, that stretched all the way back to its early form formation. The rock record on the Moon indicates, indeed, that uh, the Moon had a magnetic, mag magnetic field, which makes it a magnetosphere. And because the Moon is so close, it, the Moon's magnetosphere is inside the Earth's magnetosphere yeah. for, for, for several hundred million years, perhaps. And so what's happening is those two fields get interconnected. And when they do, then material from the Earth uh, will run down that magnetic field and precipitate uh, into the lunar environment. That's where that field line tells them it's going to go. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this configuration early on is exactly the kind of configuration we see with Europa in Jupiter's magnetic huh. uh, magnetosphere, okay? So the more we know and study what happens between Europa and Jupiter and how their magnetic fields are interconnected, the more we'll understand what the early Earth and Moon's magnetosphere was like. Uh, 
But what happens is uh, early on, the sun was very active, uh, coronal mass ejections uh, all the time, far more than we have today, huge sunspots, and it produced a lot of energy in the ultraviolet and uh, x-rays. And as it does that, what happens is that heats the uh, atmosphere, uh, which expands, and also ionizes the upper part of the atmosphere, creating the layer we call the ionosphere. Well, that is going to move out. Uh, it, it, it's like, uh, um, here's another math thing. You got a lot of pressure here, <laughs> low pressure there, and therefore that material is going to move to the high, from high pressure to low pressure. You know, it's yeah. got uh, something to do with thermodynamics, all right? Well, the, the ionized uh, uh, ionosphere material is just going to run down that field line. And if that field line runs all the way to the poles of the moon, which it does in this case, then the regolith on the moon is going to be hammered with material from the upper atmosphere of the Earth. That's so weird. Now, that <laughs> means all the nitrogen and some of the things that we also found in the lunar rocks, and we couldn't figure out where the nitrogen's coming from. It's not coming from the solar wind. You know, it, 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 far more nitrogen uh, was there than, than we would expect from the solar wind. It had to come from somewhere. Well, it's coming from the Earth. Yeah. And it came probably during the time the uh, moon had a magnetosphere. And by, the, by the way, I forgot to, to, to ask you, I mean, why is nitrogen so weird? Like, how, how do you rule out solar wind? Is it because it needs earthly processes to, to be found naturally? Or? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, uh, nitrogen is in the solar wind, but in an extremely low amount. No, I see right? more of it. Yeah. It. So, so it's about its ionization state. Uh, it's also about uh, the uh, quantity, um, and, and so um, those add up to mean that additional nitrogen is there well beyond what would be in the normal solar wind impacting the, the, uh, the moon and absorbing that solar wind. Yeah. But it's really oh go, go ahead. Go well, ahead. <laughs> the magnetosphere, just like we are protected from the solar wind, now the moon is protected by the mm -hmm. solar wind. And so processes that we're familiar with uh, on the moon or here on Earth are now happening on the moon. So now that means if the moon is outgassing, which it does, and it still does today, like all, all our planets are still outgassing, they're still cooling off from when they were made. We're not dead, you know, inside. We're still very active, and that's true on the moon. Uh, then the magnetosphere of the moon is going to hold that material in. It's going to hang on to an atmosphere that's being created as the moon outgasses, or even as the moon becomes more volcanically active.